Hi everybody, it's October 22nd, 2017. People of the Lie, the Hope for Healing Human Evil. Scott Peck, brilliant analysis of individual evil, the distinction between evil people and uh, good people committing evil acts, the definition that he got from his son uh, when he asked his son, who was, I think, eight years old, what is evil? And his son said, it's live, spelled backwards. And, well, simply put, evil wants to destroy life, and goodness wants to enhance life, wants to foster, support life. We have an awful lot of evil going on, and you all know that. The reason why I'm doing this video is because of the many comments that I got from people underneath my um, video, Trump uh, dropping white phosphorus on Syria. And in that video, I did you know, say that Americans are responsible. Um, I've said that in my five and a half years in many videos. And people do get very, very upset, and there's an awful lot of people who also understand that you cannot separate yourself from your own government, from your military. You cannot claim that silence, which equals consent, is not in part responsible for the nightmare that we are living. You cannot claim that people who are apathetic, people who are... Um, just interested in their own comfort and don't want to be bothered, uh, people who know that their government and mainstream media is lying, but they continue to listen to their government officials and continue to watch mainstream media, you cannot possibly say that they are not responsible. Until we all take responsibility for this nightmare, until we face our own contributions to this nightmare, then we will get nowhere. And frankly, um, it's been my experience that the ordinary good people can't take responsibility for anything. They're at such a low level of consciousness where everything is about protecting their own ego. They have to be right and they don't face themselves in the mirror. They have this attitude or belief that they are good, and anything that counters that, well, they attack, and they don't believe. So, um, until we do raise our consciousness, until we do accept our own responsibility. Now, am I directly responsible for, you know, the crimes that my government has committed? No. Am I indirectly? Yeah. I spent decades, you know, believing that I cared, believing that I was compassionate, and it was just a belief. Um, yes, I was a justice freak, okay, and I didn't like lying, so I didn't outright lie, but I lived a lie. You know, I claim to be compassionate and caring because I would watch a news segment and, well, kind of squint my eyes and shake my head and, and I would say, wow, what a shame. But then I would just go back into my own life and do nothing about what I had just seen. I'd have dinner parties, you know, with uh, friends and we would discuss world events and politics and we would discuss how, you know, our military was lying to us, our intelligence agencies were lying to us. I was against the Iraq war, but did I just go on about my business and not really care? Yeah, I did. But it was only until I really took a hard look at myself and how I believed certain things about myself 
and then asking myself, was it true that I found out that I was living a lie? And until we do that kind of really painful work, it is, it's not easy, you know, to, to admit that you've been a hypocrite, that you've been lying. No, not outright. The outright lies we all know we're telling. It's those insidious lies that we tell ourselves and we just go on living them. But I suppose it's true that until you're really pulled up short, you don't really get to know that you're lying to yourself. When you're comfortable and you're just going about your business and doing the same thing every single day, um, you can live a lie for your entire life. And until we pull ourselves out of that low consciousness, raise that consciousness, and really, really face the truth about our own self, our own government, our own military, and our really a lack of participation in what our government is doing, voting every two years or four years for a president, when you find out that your vote really meant nothing, it, it, presidents are selected, but when you really ask yourself, is that really all I had to do was just vote? for Congress, men and women every two years, and a president every four years? Is, was that the extent of my obligation? Was that the extent of my responsibility? Could I really claim that I was, you know, a responsible American? No, of course not. Um, I also had to face the fact that my care was rather disingenuous because it didn't compel me to take any action. My compassion, you know, it was rather selective, which is not true compassion. And once again, until you do that kind of work, you get to see the difference between care and compassion when you have a low level of consciousness and that care and compassion when you have raised your consciousness because that care does become a generative force like Mark Passio says. And the compassion wells up. Um, it just wells up in you. It, it's not something that's manufactured. And that's when you begin to, to become an individual who can't not speak out, who can't not take action. And when you do raise your consciousness, you begin to understand the difference between speaking values and actually living them. Speaking principles and really living them. So in my case, the truth became sacrosanct. And I think in many ways, well, I don't think we can separate truth, God, love, I think they're all one and the same. And so when I say that my love of truth, while it is not this sentimental love, but it is a love, because I cannot, I can't, I can't do anything but truth. I can't have liars in my life. If, if people lie, then they need to take some responsibility and work on um, their issues that make them lie. 
And if they don't do that, I, I, I can't, I can't be around them. Um, and that has left me in a position of a lot of pain because there's an awful lot of people who I really, really like, who I had a good time with, who I had a lot of fun with. But the lying got to the point where I realized that we didn't have a friendship. We had nothing. If I couldn't trust them, then I... Why was I hanging about with people that I can't trust? If I see Christians who are not doing anything in terms of trying to relieve some of the suffering that is taking place today, if I see Christians who are speaking a good line about themselves, but not actually trying on a daily basis to live in accordance with Jesus' teachings, I can't be around them. And I say that because there's an awful lot of people who think that, well, I can't say an awful lot, but I've read comments, and people think that I have it out for Christians when I don't. I have it out for hypocrites. I have it out for people who call themselves Christians but refuse to work on themselves and lie and then attack other people who call them out on their lies. I, I can't say that I have it out. That's, that's, um, that almost sounds like, you know, I'm living you know, to try to take revenge or something. That's not the case. I just can't be around them. And um, I can't be around people who, who use all of these justifications to support beliefs that clearly are not true. It's their belief, okay, but it doesn't mean that it's fact. And there is a big distinction there. So people who cannot tolerate someone else's beliefs or can't tolerate somebody saying, well, I respect that you have these beliefs, but they're not mine. And I don't know what mine are. Um, if, if they're going to attack somebody like that, then um, sorry. You're part of the problem and not part of the solution at all. And it did get to a point with me that, you know, those Christians who lie, and I've spoken about this before, um, and who refuse to take responsibility for the lie, and then want to really lash out at the person who's calling them out. I'm scared for them at this point because they're living a lie. They're, they're the people of the lie. And it's clear in the Bible. God believes that lying is an abomination. And God ain't going to be taking liars. So for those Christians who have these beliefs that they're going to heaven and they're not working on themselves, they're not trying to um, clean up their own lies, they're not doing that serious work that Scott Peck talks about. When you claim to be a Christian, take it seriously. And that's one of the reasons why he wrote this book and wrote it in the way that he did, was because he wants people to really take life seriously. He wants Christians to take life, to take their Christianity seriously. He is a Christian. Um, so, but what I have seen, Christian or not Christian, are 
an awful lot of people who just cannot take responsibility for even the slightest thing that they do wrong. And yes, we can do wrong and we can do right. And adults really do know the difference. They know what a lie is and they know what speaking the truth is. So if they claim that they don't know, they're lying again. You know, I've always known that the spiritual road is not an easy road to walk. It is incredibly hard. And you cannot be on that road seriously if you're not working on your own self. If you're not facing those difficult personal questions if you're not facing your own self in the mirror, if you're not taking responsibility for the sins that you create or commit and you are just believing that Jesus died for our sins so we get to sin forever and you believe that you're going to heaven? You believe that you're going to be one of the chosen ones when in the Bible it says that the road is really narrow really narrow which means few people are going to be going to heaven so when I ask Christians well if a few people are going to heaven why do you think you're get, getting there you know um, because they repent I've asked Christians what does it mean to repent and do you know that I have never really received an adequate answer they just simply say well you seriously ask forgiveness from God do you really think that that's it God then has really paved an easy easy road for all of you huh but that's not what the Bible says and in fact in the Bible it says Jesus will forgive you for your sins and he says, go, but sin no more, which means that you really need to take a look at yourself. You need to admit to yourself all of the things that you have done wrong and work on yourself to not commit those same sins. Lying is probably the biggest sin of all. That's why God believes lying is an abomination. And I don't think that God is, mm, white lies are okay. It's just those big lies that are not. All lies. Every lie. It breaks down trust. And if we can't trust one another, we've got nothing at all. And we're all sitting ducks, vulnerable, vulnerable to get destroyed by those who are evil the real evil people so those who get upset with me when I I do blame Americans I do not believe for an instant that if Americans were mature and if they actually did the work to mature to grow and to get to a higher consciousness, to get to that place where your care is actually generative, where it compels you to take action, where you are at that level of higher consciousness, you are on a road where you, you can't not now live the principles that you speak. You live them. How many Americans do you know that live the principles that they speak about themselves? I know <laughs> hardly any. When you have a people on the whole who are lying and living a lie and at a low consciousness where 
protecting their ego is really the most important thing. And that means that they have to be right when they're wrong. But they'll believe that they're right. And they'll get an awful lot of support for those beliefs that are wrong, but they're, but doesn't matter. It's their belief. So they get support from other people, committing even more sins by, I don't know, gossiping and telling people about the wrong uh, that was not committed by them. They'll make it the other person who committed the wrong. And then they'll get that, oh, wow, I can't believe that person did that to you. I've known so many people like that. Um, when you have a people who don't really care about anything but their own comfort and a people who are narcissistic, then you will have a people who don't care about what their government is doing, what their military is doing. And they'll believe all of the lies. See, acceptance of lies is also a sin. And how many Americans know that their government is lying to them, know that mainstream media is lying to them, but they continue on, they don't change, they still get the lies and they accept the lies, so they become part of that dance. They become part of the evil dance. You cannot separate out your responsibility in this mess. We all have to take a, a, a real hard look at ourselves. And now, well, yesterday, maybe even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, a long, long time ago, because Scott Peck, not only does a brilliant analysis of individual evil, but group evil. So here, he is doing an analysis. He was hired by our military to, to analyze the atrocities committed in South Vietnam, Milay. Milay? Milay, I'm sorry. Atrocities committed by American troops, task force Barker. And I'm going to, I took some notes from that just to try to make this a little bit faster. And I'll probably have to do this in two videos. Um, but March 16, 1968, Task Force Barker moved into a small group of hamlets known collectively as Milai in South Vietnam. It was supposed to be a search and destroy mission, American troops searching for Viet Cong soldiers to kill them. Army intelligence indicated that the Viet Cong were being harbored by the villagers of My Lai. Enlist enlisted men and junior officers of the task force took their orders, orders from senior officers, the order followers, all troops were supposed to be familiar with the Geneva Conventions, making it a crime to harm non-combatants or even a combatant that lays down his arms and surrenders due to sickness or wounds. That is part of our military's uh, job, their responsibility to inform all troops of the Geneva Conventions. So all elements of Task Force Barker were involved in these atrocities, but it was C Company, or better known as Charlie Company. It was the 1st Battalion, 20th Infantry of the 11th Light Infantry Brigade, who were directly involved. It was Charlie Company that moved into the hamlets, found no enemy combatants, no one fired on Charlie Company, no one fired on American troops, 
and Charlie Company found unarmed women, children, and old men. So what took place? What took place is um, just absolute evil. Now in this chapter, which is called Milai, an examination of group evil, the group evil, C Company in particular, our military coming out and he talks of how specialization also is, um, it helps to create evil because when everybody is specialized with their special uh, task, then something happens and they're indirectly responsible, but because they're not directly responsible, they get to absolve themselves of responsibility because, well, that wasn't my task. Though they're part of the whole chain and the chain of command. And then he extends it to the American people. But what were some of those atrocities? Some of the things that then happened on March 16, 1968 are unclear. What is clear, however, is that the troops of C Company killed at least somewhere between five and 600 unarmed villagers. These people were killed in a variety of ways. In some instances, troops would simply stand at the door of a village hut and spray into it with rifle fire blindly killing those inside. In other instances, villagers, including children, were shot down as they attempted to run away. The most large-scale killings occurred in the particular hamlet of Milay, Milay 4. There, the first platoon of Charlie Company, under the command of Lieutenant William Calley, Jr., herded villagers into groups of 20 to 40 or more who were then slaughtered by rifle fire, machine gun fire, or grenades. There are also gang rapes that Scott Peck has left out. There's an awful lot of YouTube videos on the atrocities that occurred. And the killing did take a long time. It went on throughout the morning. One person tried to stop it. It was a helicopter pilot, a warrant officer, flying in support of the search and destroy mission. Even from the air, he could see what was happening. He landed on the ground and attempted to talk to the troops to no avail. Back in the air again, he radioed to headquarters and superior officers who seemed unconcerned. So he gave up and went about his business. The number of soldiers involved, they estimate there were about 50 who actually pulled the triggers. Approximately 200 soldiers directly witnessed the killings. And 500 men in task force Barker that knew about the atrocities. But nobody spoke of them. And the American public found out because of a letter written by Ron Reidenhauer he wrote it at the end of March 1969, a full year later. He wrote it to several congressmen. Reidenauer himself was not part of Task Force Barker, but had later heard of the atrocities and idle conversation from friends who had been at Millet. 
Milani. And he wrote his letter three months after his return to civilian life. Preface to Group Evil. It's a subchapter of this chapter. Triggers are pulled by individuals. Orders are given and executed by individuals. In the last analysis, every single human act is ultimately the result of an individual choice. No one of, no one of the individuals who participated in the atrocities at Milai or in their cover-up is blameless. Even the helicopter pilot, the only one brave enough and good enough to attempt to stop the massacre, can be blamed for not reporting what he saw beyond the first echelon of authority over him. So he writes, Scott Peck, until now our focus has been on specific individuals whom I have labeled evil and distinguished from the vast majority of other individuals I have designated not evil. Even if we allow that this sharp distinction is somewhat arbitrary, that there is a whole continuum between those who are thoroughly evil and those who are not at all evil, we are left facing a problem. Who is it that approximately, or how is it, that approximately 500 men, the majority of whom were undoubtedly not evil as individuals, could all have participated in an act as monstrous, as evil, as that at Milai. So, he then talks about what happens to individuals and groups. For many years, it has seemed to me that human groups tend to behave in much the same way as human individuals, except at a level that is more primitive and immature than what one might expect. So when we see all of these protesters, these liberal progressives, who were protesting out on the street, acting really in a very primitive, immature manner, when they didn't get their way, Hillary was not elected, it's amazing that Americans still believe that their presidents are elected, that their vote actually counts. But when we saw all of that kind of behavior, a lot of that was the group energy, um, the uh, Antifa groups. When we see all of these part people participating, and it's not just young people, it's older people. And they're all screaming insults at anybody who does not agree with them. Any individual has a, who has a differing opinion gets screamed at in the most vile but immature and rather primitive manner. And he speaks of groups how very often individuals within groups don't want to be the leader. There's more people who want to be followers than there are people who want to be leaders. And followers very often can absolve themselves of their own, own wrongdoing because they can blame it on taking orders from their leader. As if the individual has no free will. But individuals caught up in groups also feel, feel that peer pressure and they go along to get along. And they never want to do anything that will cause them derision within the group. So, 
he does talk about that. He does talk about specialization is one of the greatest advantages of groups um, because everybody can just kind of, you know, the buck doesn't stop here. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do in my little special, you know, uh, cubicle, my little task. He talks about specialization contributing to the immaturity of groups and their potential for evil through several different mechanisms, which you can read if you would like. This, by the way, People of the Line, there's an audio YouTube video, so you can listen to that. But what I really want to focus on is the group evil that took place in the American people. And I will perhaps read that part um, in another video because I don't want this to go on for too long. But we really need to look at how we have through our own, well, what he says is laziness and narcissism, allowed this nightmare to manifest. In fact, he even says in this chapter, he talks about how, how important it is that the American people wake up. And he wrote this book, when was it? The first edition was, came out in uh, 1983. It's 2017. The American people have not woken up. But he talks about that that's essential. The American people have to wake up. They have to do the work necessary to grow and to become serious individuals in order for they to act in ways that will prevent further atrocities and now we commit atrocities every single day, and now we're committing atrocities against Americans. And you can pretend like Americans have no responsibility in this. You can pretend that it's oh the GMOs and it's the um, and it's the frequencies and it's the um, poisons and the dumbing down and the fluoride. But this has been going on forever with the American people. You know, he's talking about Vietnam. Baby boomers know. Baby boomers know how much our military was lying. They know how much uh, the Johnson administration was lying. They know how much our government was lying. Did they do anything? to hold accountable the liars. No. We go out and vote for the lesser of two evils, which means we got evil. So he talks about the largest group, the group evil, American society, in 1968. While the military may have been crashing around in Vietnam like a crazed bull, it did not get there of its own accord. The mindless beast was sent there and let loose by the United States government acting on behalf of the American people. Why? Why did we wage that war? So he talks about the reasons, right? Communism, that monolithic evil that we were trying to stop to guard our freedom here. 
it was America's duty as the world's most economically powerful nation to lead the opposition against communism. And communism should be opposed wherever it arose, by whatever means necessary. This combination of attitudes comprising the American posture in international relations had its origins in the late 1940s and early 1950s. The problem, however, is that by a scant dozen years later, there was a wealth of evidence to indicate that communism was not, if in fact it had ever been, a force that was either monolithic or necessarily evil. Now, one could really take Scott Peck to task on that when we look at the millions, millions and millions of people who died at the hands of these communist governments, China and Mao Zedong and Stalin, Soviet Russia, Soviet Union. Um, but our military involvement in Vietnam began in the period between 1954 and 1956 when the idea of a monolithic communist menace seemed realistic. A dozen years later, it was no longer realistic. Yet at precisely the time when it had created, when it had ceased, I'm sorry, when it had ceased to be realistic, when we should have been readjusting our strategy and withdrawing from Vietnam, we began to seriously escalate our military involvement there in defense of obsolescent attitudes. Why? Why, beginning around 1964, did America's behavior in Vietnam become increasingly unrealistic and inappropriate? There are two reasons, laziness and once again narcissism. Attitudes have a kind of inertia. Once set in motion, they will keep going, even in the face of the evidence. To change an attitude requires a considerable, a considerable amount of work and suffering. The process must begin either in an effortly, effortly maintained posture of constant self-doubt and criticism, or else in a painful acknowledgement that what we thought was right all along may not be right after all, then it proceeds into a state of confusion. This state is quite uncomfortable. We no longer seem to know what is right or wrong or which way to go, but it is a state of openness and therefore of learning and growing. It is only from the quicksand of confusion that we are able to leap to the new and better vision. I think we may properly regard the men who governed America at the time of Milai, the Johnson administration, as lazy and self-satisfied. They, like most more ordinary individuals, had little taste for intellectual confusion, not for the effort involved in maintaining posture of constant self-doubt and criticism. Now, understand this written in uh, before 1983 because he actually had completed this book, People of the Lie, before he completed Road Less Traveled. And the Road Less Traveled, when did that come out? In the late 70s, I think? So this was completed even earlier than 1983. And Did he know about the military-industrial complex? Did, did Scott Peck know that military, that war is profit? Did he know about the deep state and the shadow um, government that pulls the strings? Did he know that our uh, presidents and our congressmen and women, they're puppets? Did he know how bought and sold our government was? So it's not just 
the attitude of the Johnson administration and they not wanting to admit that they were wrong about communism. We all know that clearly now. So he might be writing a different book if he were alive today. But he goes on to say that the laziness and the self-satisfaction of the Johnson administration, they, like most more ordinary individuals, had little taste for intellectual confusion, nor for the effort involved in maintaining a posture of constant self-doubt and criticism. So, I don't, Johnson certainly was a narcissist, that's for sure. Um, I think, you know, this writing has more to do with ordinary Americans than those who were uh, committing the war crimes of Vietnam. They had their own agenda that was not so open then. But what happened to the baby boomers who were out in the streets fighting against these wars? Where are they today? How many of them have? Clearly uh, lost their... They may have found themselves at a crossroad and took the wrong road took the easy, comfortable road rather than the hard road of holding people accountable for their lies and trying to stop further atrocities. But he goes on, Thus far, we have been focusing on the laziness involved in clinging to old maps and attitudes that have become obsolete. Let us also examine the narcissism. We are our attitudes. If someone criticizes an attitude of mine, I feel he or she is criticizing me. If one of my opinions is proved wrong, then I have been wrong. My self-image of perfection has been shattered. Individuals and nations cling to obsolete and outworn ideas not simply because it requires work to change them, but also because in their narcissism they cannot imagine that their ideas and views could be wrong. They believe themselves to be right. Oh, we are quick to superficially disclaim our infallibility, but deep inside most of us, particularly when, particularly when we have apparently been successful and powerful we consider ourselves invariably in the right. And how often have you met Americans just like that? They are right. No matter how obviously wrong they are, they are right. And because they don't do the work necessary to change their own perfectionism, their own narcissism, because you can be someone who has narcissistic tendencies without being a pathological narcissist. And we have to root out all of those narcissistic tendencies. We've got to do the work necessary on our self to mature. And come out of that um, immature attitude, which is very childlike. Those who can't admit their wrongs, those who will not take responsibility and do the work necessary so that they don't commit any more sins, so that they stop lying, so that they stop hurting people. No, they're right. And if they continue to defend that position, 
they'll do what it takes. And they will begin to commit further wrongs, sins. The psyche is amazing. No matter how obvious, no matter how obvious, and no matter how slight, is the wrong. If you have that individual who needs to be right, they can, come, they can become vicious to maintain their belief. It's sad, really, but that will not be a person who will be part of the solution. That will be the person who continues to destroy trust in relationships and community. That will be someone who's not serious about life and not serious about the principles that they claim they have. Ordinarily, if our noses are rubbed in the evidence, we can tolerate the painful narcissistic injury involved. And an awful lot of people can't. And I think that a lot of you are identifying with what I am saying based on the comments and correspondence that I've had with a lot of you. Ordinarily, if our noses are rubbed in the evidence, we can tolerate the painful narcissistic injury involved, admit our need for change, and correct our outlook. But as in the case with certain individuals, the narcissism of whole nations may at times exceed the normal bounds. When this happens, the nation, instead of readjusting in light of the evidence, sets about attempting to destroy the evidence. So you can have a group doing that, or you can have individuals who do that. This was what America was up to in the 1960s. The situation in Vietnam presented us with evidence of the fallibility of our worldview and the limits of our potency. So rather than rethinking it, we set about to destroy the situation in Vietnam and all of Vietnam with it, if necessary, which was evil. Which was evil. Evil has already been defined most simply as the use of power to destroy others for the purpose of defending or preserving the integrity of one's sick self. Strangely enough, on a certain level, President Johnson and the men of his administration knew that what they were doing was evil. Otherwise, why all the lying? It was so bizarre and seemingly out of character that it is difficult for us merely to recall the extraordinary national dishonesty of those days, a scant 15 years ago, 15 years ago from the 1983 uh, writing of this book. Well, this hitting the market. But President Johnson gave an order to begin bombing North Vietnam and escalate the war in 1964. The Gulf of Tonkin incident was apparently was a deliberate fraud. Through this fraud he obtained from Congress the authority to wage war without Congress ever formally declaring it, which was uh, his constitutional responsibility. Then he set about borrowing the money to pay for the war, diverting funds, earmark for other programs, and extorting savings bonds from the salaries of federal employees so that the American public would not have to immediately pay increased taxes or feel the burden of the escalation because the American people might, might not like that. This book is entitled People of the Lie because lying is both a cause and a manifestation of evil. It's the cause of evil. It's the manifestation of evil. 
all lies are evil. It is partly by their lying that we recognize the evil. President Johnson clearly did not want the American people to fully know and understand what he was doing in Vietnam in their name. He knew that what he was doing would be ultimately unacceptable to them. His defrauding the electorate was not only evil in itself, but was also evidence of the awareness of the evil of his actions since he felt compelled to cover them up. But it would be a mistake and a potentially evil rationalization itself for us to blame the evil of those days entirely on the Johnson administration. We must ask why Johnson was successful in defrauding us. We must ask or why did we allow ourselves to be defrauded for so long? Not everyone was. A small minority was quick to recognize the wool was being pulled over our eyes that something rather dark and bloody was being perpetrated by our nation. But why were most of us not aroused to air or suspicion or even significant concern about the nature of the war? Once again, we are confronted with our all-too-human laziness and narcissism. Basically, it was just too much trouble. We all had our lives to lead, doing our day-to-day -day jobs, buying new cars, painting our houses, sending our kids to college, as the majority of members of any group are content to let the leadership be exercised by the few, so as a citizenry, we were content to let the government do its thing. It was Johnson's job to lead, ours to follow. The citizenry was simply too lethargic to become aroused. Besides, we shared with Johnson his enormous large as Texas narcissism. Surely, our national attitudes and policies couldn't be wrong. Surely our government had to know what it was doing. After all, we'd elected them, hadn't we? And surely they had to be good and honest men, for they were products of our wonderful democratic system, which certainly couldn't go seriously awry. And surely, whatever type of regime our rulers and experts and government specialists thought was right, for Vietnam must be right. For weren't we the greatest of nations and the leader of the free world? By allowing ourselves to be easily and blatantly defrauded, we as a whole, we as a whole people participated, participated in the evil. The evil, the years of lying, and manipulation of the Johnson administration was directly conducive to the whole atmosphere of lying and manipulation and evil that pervaded our presence in Vietnam during those years. We contributed and we continue to. And because the American people, we have to face the fact that we are not a moral people. And good people sitting around doing nothing allows evil to flourish. So, on the whole, we are not a good people. And yes, we do have to face that fact because it is the truth. And I will say it right out. And I know that when I say things like this, I don't gain in popularity. And many people get upset. The Iraq War. I mean, we've committed so many atrocities. And these atrocities have been committed in our name. And people who don't live in this country look to Americans to stop the evil. 
because they understand that our government is thoroughly evil and our military is evil and the order followers don't get a pass simply because they are following orders they are more responsibility for the atrocities committed by them than the order giver because the order giver is not pulling that trigger or dropping that bomb it's the order follower that had that individual who pulled the trigger, who dropped the bomb, had a moral backbone. They wouldn't be able to do it. After doing it once or twice, if they had any kind of moral sense about them, they would be sickened by killing so many innocent people. So if the order followers stopped following orders, this kind of evil would not take place because you think people like Trump are going to go out with a gun? No. Frankly, they sit behind their big desks, they live luxurious lives, and they have no moral center and they don't care and they are not courageous at all the order followers have to stop committing the evil and we all have to take a look at our contribution working getting a paycheck in fields, in, in um, well, virtually every institution now is corrupted and evil. Medical establishment, vaccines, nurses, doctors, and those working in the offices, pushing these vaccines on infants and children, it's an evil. The adults who are getting these, lining up to get these vaccines, adults, you know, really, if they're not smart enough to do the research on their own, I'm sorry. But children and infants, they rely on adults to protect them. They're not being protected. Psychiatrists who are putting, on, uh, putting these children on all of these incredibly dangerous medications, putting infants on psychiatric medications. The dosages are the same that they give adults. It's an evil. And everybody who works in the mental health system who is not speaking out about this evil is complicit with this evil. And they absolutely are responsible. They can't separate themselves. They can't just say, well, you know, it's just my job. Teachers, people who are working uh, in public schools, school administrators, everyone working, collecting a paycheck in a public school today is committing an evil because if they are not speaking out about Common Core and how unbelievably evil it is in dumbing down our children and the indoctrination so clear now creating robots at the end of the 12 years creating humans that can't really think for themselves part of Common Core is to teach children to obey authority but it also has completely destroyed critical thinking. So everyone in these schools are responsible for the evil that they're committing towards these children because they're destroying them. They're not enhancing their lives. They're destroying their lives. Everybody who's not talking out about the Wi-Fi, 
that's uh, that is destroying their brains and and their health and and causing young girls to be infertile I'm sorry you cannot say that you're not responsible you are and what's most important to you obviously is the comfort of your life not children and not not working towards making the society better because you're at a low level of consciousness everything's about you you may appear to you know be not about you and you may um, be working in professions that a lot of people go wow you really care about I don't know the mentally ill or or children or but it's all about the paycheck and it's about your comfortable life ultimately because you are working in a system that destroys children it's an evil that you participate in and I could carry that, you know, be, all right, government workers, same is true. Mental health workers, people who work for the pharmaceutical industry. I go to the doctors and I see these, these, it, it's like amazing how many of these, uh, what are they called? Big pharma representatives that come in, they wheel in all of their samples. How can you claim that they're not as they're wheeling in their vaccines into the doctor's office? That doctor will be giving the vaccine to an infant and that vaccine, that one shot, could destroy that child's life? And you're going to tell me that the doctor is not responsible and the uh, the pharmaceutical representative is not responsible? How can you separate this out? It can't be separated out. The only ones who will ever stop the evil that is taking place now are the American people. But they won't do a thing if they're irresponsible, immature, and only care about themselves. That's the bottom line. That's why this evil gets worse and worse and worse. That's why more and more people are getting destroyed all over the world. Now, I read these comments from people who, who get really upset. It's not the American people. It's the evil elite. Really? Okay. Hmm. Well, um, I don't think you're able to see clearly what's taking place. People who clearly want to protect Trump. You know, how, how could I say that it was Trump that was doing it? You know, this idea that we have about our government that is completely false, but an awful lot of Americans still have it, right? The president commander-in-chief. Um, well, white phosphorus landed in Syria. And there's an awful lot of evidence that it was our military. Trump's the commander-in-chief, right? Didn't he campaign for that job? Are we really not to hold Trump responsible? Are you kidding me? Who cares if he's a puppet? He's committing the evil. He's taking the orders from the deep state, from the shadow government, from the Rothschilds, whoever. But he plays his part. Those who think Trump is a good Christian, that scares me. It really scares me. Because clearly, could you can you see Trump and Jesus 
as, you know, I don't know, similar? Or can you, can you tell me what it is that Trump is doing that allows you to think that this man is a good Christian when he's killing innocent, innocent people with his drone strikes and his eight months in office? Is it eight months? Approximately? Or 10 months, however long, in his time, just the, over this year, he has killed more innocent civilians than Obama did with his drone strikes in eight years. In eight years. Oh, that's right, Trump. Yeah, it's not Trump, it's the deep state. God. Could a good Christian? Could a real serious Christian occupy the White House? I don't think so. Not, not in what has manifested here in our country. Because we have become so sick and disturbed that the well-adjusted are thoroughly sick and disturbed. And they participate in this system that allows our presidents to take in what Hillary Clinton almost got a trillion dollars for her campaign. Is that is that right? Who allows that to uh, take place? The American people. And to suggest that we don't have any responsibility in, in this nightmare is also to suggest that we don't have any power whatsoever. That we're just these little pawns who get to live out our lives as slaves to the elite globalists. It's the, that's the psyche they want you to have. You don't think you have any power? You won't have any power. You think it's okay to continue to lie and to manipulate and to delude yourself into thinking that you're good and, and to continue to be silent and just accept lie after lie after lie? You think that's okay? You don't have much integrity. You're not a serious human being. You take nothing seriously except for your own comfort. That you take seriously. And I will say that what we are living today, it might be more intense now, but we've been this way my entire life. We've been the people of the life, my entire life. We've accepted all of the lies throughout my entire life. So it's 2017 now, so a lot of people leave comments, how can you blame the American people? They've been eating GMOs. We, were, we weren't eating GMOs in the 80s, in the 70s, in the 60s when we were already buying all of the lies, the Johnson administration, all of the bullshit lies of every administration, the Gulf War I, Persian Gulf War. We weren't so damaged in 2003 when we went into Iraq for what? We weren't so damaged when we heard our leader then tell us to go shopping after 9-11. But we were lazy. And we were narcissistic. And we were people of low consciousness. Who didn't really want to do much work at all. We just wanted to live our privileged life, and we didn't really care about what was going on over there. But now we don't even care what's going on over here. Yeah, apathy, 
It's not selective. Evil, not selective. But genuine care and compassion, it's also not selective. So those two are the forces. That's the spiritual war going on. That's the spiritual war. When people actually raise their consciousness, then they can engage in that spiritual war. But at that low level of consciousness, it's all about you. You're not engaging in any kind of war. And you're part of the problem, not the solution. Yeah, I know. Sorry that I've upset you. What can I say? I think I have a talent for it. <laughs>